Okay, thank you, Ramya, and, and thank you to Devin and, and the Risk Assessment Forum for having me here today. Um, I, I think Ramya's research really gives us a, a concrete example of the importance of, of considering susceptibility in decision-making. Also gives us some idea of the challenges, but shows that this, this is possible. There are, there are methods that we can move ahead with. And so in, in, in the rest of, of the uh, session here, what I would like to do is through the lens of the Science and Decisions Report from the National Academy of Sciences, I'd like to talk a little bit about the committee's perspectives on susceptibility and cumulative risk assessment. Now, first of all, uh, my first slide here, thank God, a panel of experts. I, I want to uh, just give thanks to, uh, to I was the chair of that committee, and, and it was a, a tremendous uh, working effort. And, and those of you, everyone seems to have kind of one take on what's now called the Silver Book, and it has been influential. But there's a tremendous amount of material there that covers a full range of, of the pressing issues in, in risk assessment and decision making. So I really recommend that, that folks who are, particularly if you're interested in, in susceptibility and cumulative risk process, that you um, really take a hard look at that. And today I want to focus on, on the work of, of some great people. So in this cartoon, uh, one of the, it, I think of the, the great contributors in, in the group that the contributors to the, at, to the aspects I'm going to be discussing today, John Levy, who I know um, is, is signed up to attend and is going to be presenting in the future in this, in this forum of uh, webinars, did a tremendous job in, on pulling together the state of the art on cumulative risk assessment and others, and, and so when you get so close to a report, you kind of know it by chapters. And, and so, uh, so two chapters I'm going to talk about, five and seven today. Five is the, is the chapter that, that really took on susceptibility and, and got a lot of attention because of, of, of the recommendation about a unified approach to cancer and non-cancer risk assessment. But it really is about susceptibility and informing our decisions better by using a better understanding of the dose-response relationship. So I wanted to quickly go over the major themes of the Silver Book. First of all, um, borrowing and, and, and uh, expressing the great contributions from the um, e ecological scientists in the group and, and the ecologists who I think who are probably uh, out in front of, of us in some aspects of cumulative risk assessment. The, the report really talks about problem formulation in, an, in a way of making sure you ask the right questions at the beginning of an assessment. And this is particularly important when we think about the tremendous variability in the population and the need to consider susceptibility. So susceptibility and population variability, also a very important theme. We've mentioned and, and you heard Ramya talk about the unified approach to dose response assessment. I'll talk about that. And probably others haven't really considered that cumulative risk assessment is a major part of this report, including social determinants of risk and non-chemical risk factors. Improving the utility, then a new framework was also a big part of it. And throughout the report, there is emphasized the need for stakeholder involvement in framing the issues right up front in problem formulation, but in also understanding issues of susceptibility and cumulative risk. And the major thrust of the report is really about better solutions to our environmental problems. So this next slide is, I wish this were simpler because I've been teaching this in class and, and uh, as a chair I get to give all the presentations. And, and we, we came um, and, and recommended a new approach to risk analysis that is three phases. And so in this slide you see kind of the uh, rather complex three phase approach that we recommend. The middle part there, the conduct, planning and conduct of the risk assessment, really draws upon the, the four-step process of the Red Book, but has a very important um, addition, and that's the, the final stage of that component, stage three, confirming that this thing works. All right? have, we, have we done the right things in the assessment? Does it have the attributes that we call for in the problem formulation and the planning and scoping to make sure that we actually answered the right questions so that most importantly in phase three, risk management, we're, we're really understanding the relative health and environmental benefits and we have, we have a process that is it's kind of a continuous process that has the right kind of feedback to making the right decision, including risk communication and stakeholder involvement. So I wanted to give that kind of 
overall framework. Delving into the recommendations of, of more, okay. So probably one of the most controversial recommendations, one that's received a lot of attention, is, is the call for a consistent unified approach to those response assessment. Now, what does this mean? Well, um, folks think, oh no, we're not going to do RFDs and, and uh, thresholds anymore, but, but actually it's it, it's actually much more applied to that, to, to understanding cumulative risk, because a the systematic approach should include understanding of certain very important aspects of cumulative risk, including background disease processes and exposures, understanding vulnerable populations, and the modes of actions that may affect a chemical's dose response. Now, this next slide, uh, probably familiar concept to many people, it's an adaptation of a, of a paper by torture, but, it, but it's a, a kind of a simplified approach. And if you think about it, when you, when you saw the the dose response or the concentration response curves that Ramya presented was actually when you consider SES, low SES and high SES in the average population, very similar to this, in that as, as we begin to assess cumulative risk, we have to be aware that there will be susceptible subgroups in the population. And here you see in the, on the far left that steep dose response curve for the susceptibles as opposed to the average population or the non-susceptible. In, in the case of, uh, of lead, this, this may be uh, children from upper middle class um, families that have um, benefits that, that really make them much less susceptible to the adverse effects of lowering IQ. So getting back to the silver book on dose response, there was a, a recommendation, and, and here's the chart that kind of puts it in perspective. On dose response, we explained that the dose response relationship is very dependent upon environmental stressors and including background exposures, endogenous and, 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 and xenobiotic and biological susceptibility. So following this kind of illustration or process, there's the environmental chemical stressor, usually the focus of our kind of single substance approach risk assessment. But we have to see this within the context of background exposures and susceptibility. The next box is the individual dose response curve, where an individual, so this gives the probability for an individual, and we may very well see thresholds in the individual dose response, but when you consider the heterogeneity, background exposures of the population, and those tremendous differences in susceptibility, a population dose response curve is likely to look very much differently. In fact, this is what, what Ramya found in, in her research. This approach is also familiar to many, and, and so this, this is uh, also in the Science and Decisions book, but adapted from Tracy Woodruff's work that looked at, at the influence of other aspects um, on the, the adverse effects. And here, basically, again, analogous to Ramya's three lines, you see the, the percent of population and the, the normal bell curve of response from, from exposure and the dotted line are the healthy with no background exposure, okay? The middle distribution is are the, the healthy with background exposures. And then the, the one where you see the greater area shaded on, uh, under the adverse side of the line there are those folks that have um, background exposure plus susceptibilities within there. And, and that vulnerability can be from genetics or life stage or, or health disease status in the population or social factors. So here is the framework that was recommended in, in the Silver Book for unification of the dose response approach. Okay. And first, we talked about needing to kind of have a framework to think about cumulative risk and think about the things that that have an impact on the disease endpoint. So identifying those, the adverse effect of concern and other indicators of, of, of stages of, of, of life or um, precursors for upstream indicators of toxicity. Then consider the mode of action all right, and the background exposure and most importantly for our not talk here today is to identify there right in the middle the, the a vulnerable populations assessment to understand potential potential vulnerable groups and individuals and to consider uh, the, the endpoints of concern 
the modes of action, the background rates of the health effect, and, and other risk factors. So in the, in the case of the lead example, vulnerable population assessment would include understanding that, that uh, in this case, low so socioeconomic status may increase vulnerability there. And as, as we look at putting this together, this should shape how we develop our conceptual model for dose response selection. So now from, from susceptibility onto the, the Silver Book's recommendations about cumulative risk assessment. And in, in thinking about cumulative risk assessment, really, um, frankly, the, the single substance at a time um, is, it, it, although there may be legal mandates to regulate individual substances, it, it really doesn't get us um, to a good characterization of population risk. We really have to understand um, the vulnerability of the population and the complexity of cumulative risk because EPA is increasingly asked to address broad public health and environmental issues. Um, and, and frankly, stakeholder groups consider this very inadequately captured by current risk assessments. So if you think of, of, the, of the very challenging issues now of hydraulic fracking, global climate change, of mixtures, um, cumulative risk assessment really is a, a, a pressing need for us to move the science forward. And there's a need for cumulative risk assessments that include uh, combined risks for multiple agents and stressors, but also multiple pathways, sources of exposure, and the non-chemical risk factors, so social, uh, radiologic, physical, and psychologic stressors to be considered. Now, this is a, this is a tall order. Um, and, and, uh, and, and this is really, to the, particularly folks in the risk assessment forum, an approach that, that people have been, been challenged by, but, but this is not new thinking, but how do we get there? And so now I, I want to point to a stepwise approach that, that uh, John Levy developed as part of the work of the committee, and then the co committee worked on as well, um, but adapting the work of, of Menzi to risk management options, kind of a, a stepwise approach to cumulative risk assessment that I think for our purposes kind of brings us down to reality, shifts the focus away from having a perfect model for, for risk prediction, but pushes us in the direction of developing the best risk management options by considering cumulative risk. All right? And that first step, which is so basic in public health and, and prevention and intervention, is developing a conceptual model for the stressors of interest. All right, that significantly may be influenced by risk management options. So what does this mean? Well, under, understanding the, the exposure of concern, understanding the mode of action, understanding other types of exposures that might have a similar mode of action or endpoint, non-chemical stressors that affect the same outcome, and issues of susceptibility and vulnerability. The next step, is to look at the epidemiologic and tox data um, to, to try and understand how we might put together an initial evaluation of how those stressors could be included in a cumulative risk assessment. And focus that assessment on the stressors that contribute to the points of interest, not so that there's infinite complexity to this, but to select those that, that, have, that may benefit um, the, the decision making but also to understand and prioritize how we might approach this. So, so in, in looking at this, lots of skeptics of cumulative risk assessment will say, well, we will never be able to change uh, health care insurance for the entire population, or we'll never be able to assure outstanding nutrition for the population, or end poverty. That is not the role of EPA. And that's really not uh, the end point of the cumulative risk assessment that we're recommending in the Silver Book, but rather to understand that these non-chemical factors influence population susceptibility, to better account for that susceptibility to characterize risk, and then ultimately to make better decisions. So step three is to then line these things up and evaluate the benefit of different risk management options, looking at the characterization. Okay, so. So it's an informational process that really has as its endpoint understanding and designing the right model so that you can 
understand the, the models and stresses and of interest to make a better decision. All right, will this, will this give us, in all cases, a, a quantitative number of absolute risk for the population? No, but it will tremendously inform us and, and allow us to move forward considering the most important contributors to risk within the context of the EPA decision. And then step four uh, recognizes that this is, this is complicated, but um, it, it, it is an iterative process to, to make sure that among the various risk management options that the various economic, social, and political factors are included in the process. So, so this is uh, a somewhat mixed method. Um, some of it may be characterization and inclusion of factors in a way that is not exactly quantitative and more qualitative, but a stepwise approach uh, to moving ahead with risk assessment. So, so that's kind of the, the focus of, of the approach seen through the lens of the Silver Book. Uh, our conclusions were, un unfortunately, and this is not critical of just EPA, we all are challenged by these scientific methods, but in practice, EPA risk assessments have fallen short. Um, and it is possible that we can much better consider non-chemical stressors, uh, vulnerability, and background risk factors. Because it is so complex, though, we have to make decisions, and we have to have more simplified risk assessment tools. To orient the cumulative risk assessment about risk management options is the approach that we recommended so that we focus on the stressors under consideration. So the recommendations, to kind of conclude, of the, of the Silver Book panel were to draw upon other approaches, understanding that there are, that there are interactions between chemical and non-chemical stressors that are a very important part of cumulative risk assessment. We need to learn from our friends in, in ecologic risk assessment and social epidemiology. We ask that EPA develop guidelines for sim simpler analytical tools to support cumulative risk assessment that include greater stakeholder involvement in the short term, and again, going back to Ramya's work on uh, developing databases and default approaches to allow for incorporation of, of non-chemical stressors in the, in the absence of population-specific data uh, may be an important way to go, understanding exposure patterns, contributions of background processes, and interaction with chemical stressors. And in the long term, we need to invest in research programs to understand these interactions between chemical and non-chemical stressors, including an investment in epidemiology. So in conclusion, just wanted to kind of put the silver book in perspective. One is we have to get back to why we're doing this. Are we doing cumulative risk assessment to come up with, a, with an absolutely accurate prediction of adverse impacts in the population? Well, that may be a laudable goal, but we're doing it to inform decisions better. And I think that's, that's a very important focus of the Silver Book. And maybe it's better that we think in terms of characterization of cumulative risk rather than quantification of cumulative risk. And I think the work of Ramya and others are moving us in that direction. It's doable and possible, and, um, and, and I would hope the risk assessment forum can take those recommendations of the Silver Book as we as we move forward. So I'll stop there.